Uh, this is Carl Henrik Sharperson, Jr. of Sharperson's Executive Leadership, Leadership Innovation Strategist, and I'm here with Apex to talk about sharp leadership. Uh, I authored a book called Sharp Leadership, Overcome Adversity to Lead with Authenticity. And it has some basic leadership principles in it. And I'm gonna discuss those principles today. The number one principle is quitters never win and winners never quit. The second principle is take care of your people and your people will take care of you. The third principle is it's all about relationships. And the last one I'm gonna talk about is faith. Faith, family, and friends. Those simple principles have worked in families, churches, the military, sports, corporate, corporate executives, and every place else in the world. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Thank you, sir, appreciate it. Thank you. All righty. It's truly a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, it's all about relationships. One of the reasons I'm here is uh, one of my partners is Gary Tompkins. I think he was the president of uh, Apex for a while. Uh, and then uh, I met Chuck Baker, who's a 1975 uh, West Point grad. And uh, I met him at the, um, at the castle. We toured the castle, we got to talk, and he bought one of my books. And then he had me come and speak to a men's group that he was a part of in Greenville. And then he told me about this organization and he wanted me to speak here. So that's kind of how I ended up here. So what I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna talk about some basic leadership principles. I authored a book called Sharp Leadership, Overcome Adversity to Lead with Authenticity. And it talks about my life. But during my life, there were two bookends. The first bookend was, I was born in Washington, D.C., uh, inner city, all African American environment. And uh, at the age of 14, my dad decided to move us to Spotsylvania, Virginia, which is about 60 miles south of Washington, D.C. So I go to Spotsylvania, Virginia, and, uh, <laughs> and I um, integrated a school. Anybody familiar with the movie Remember the Titans? Okay, so that was during the same time period that I went to uh, high school, Remember the Titans. Now, during that time period, I learned a lot about life. I had people going from calling me names to being my best friend, primarily because they got to know me. And because they got to know me, we developed a relationship. And what I learned was everybody wants the same thing. I don't care what color you are. I don't care where you grew up. I don't care what your background is. Everybody wants the exact same thing. They want to be loved. They want to be respected. And they want to be successful. So early in my life, I learned that principle. And that's carried me well throughout my life. The other bookend was I had an opportunity. Uh, I was working in uh, Topeka, Kansas. And my boss and I agreed to disagree. And my boss's boss sent me to charm school at the Center for Creative Leadership in Greensboro, North Carolina, one of the top institutions non-academically for leadership. And I became an adjunct trainer for a program called the Looking Glass Experience. In that program, there's a one to seven ratio of a facilitator to a division. And you come in there, they do a bunch of assessments, and you run the company for a day. So you take a position, you run the company for the day. But what happens is, miraculously, however you behave at work, is how you behave in that simulation. So if you're one that cowers down to people when they're talking to you, that comes out in simulation. If you roll over people and treat them badly, that comes out in the simulation also. So this facilitator is looking at you while you are doing this work. And you're kind of in the mode, you're just doing it, right? And what that facilitator does, that facilitator debriefs you on how you impact the organization and how the organization impacts you. So you learn about yourself uh, in a very, very objective way and you get timely and accurate feedback, which is one of the few things that most people don't get in organizations. So at the end of this week-long session, the question was, uh, I had a couple of questions, but one of the questions I had was, I said, I think I would like to become a facilitator. So the lady that was running it, she says, you know what, I think you'd become a, I, I think you'd be a good facilitator. 
If you can come back three different times, a week at a time, and train with a facilitator, I'll certify you to become an adjunct trader. So part of my developmental plan was to go back and become a certified trader. So after about three, four, five months or something like that, uh, I got certified. So I had an opportunity to facilitate 21 of those sessions. That's 21 times 21 people in a session. So I got a good mix of really what leadership is, sales, marketing, all different parts of the country. Uh, and I, what I did was I learned one thing, most valuable thing I've ever learned in my life. At the end of the week, the question was, what are you going to do? What's the most important thing you can do to become a better leader? And guess what they would say? They would say, I've got to work on my work-life balance. Say things that, they'd say things like, I want my third wife, and she just filed for divorce. they say things like, I'm making a lot of money, and I'm traveling all over the country. I got two kids. One doesn't know me, and the other one's on drugs. They say things like, I'm very well respected, I'm 60 pounds overweight, and I just had my third stint put in. So those were the things that high-powered executives were going through. So what that taught me was, I don't care how much money you have, I don't care how much stuff you have, you got issues just like I got issues, and I understand that. So those were the two bookends of uh, the leadership principles that I put together. So there's an acronym, it's not an acronym because it's not a word, but there are four letters that I want you to remember. Q-T-F, Q-T-R-F, Q-T-R-F. The first one starts with quitters never win and winners never quit. Uh, as I did this Remember the Titans experience in Spotsylvania, Virginia, my high school coach was the third most influential person in my life. He's the one that sent the recruiter to my high school to recruit me to play football at the Naval Academy. And I didn't know what the Naval Academy was. It was only 90 miles up the road. So I went out for football for the first time in the ninth grade. Five foot six, 120 pounds soaking wet. Never played tackle football before. Coach Parks comes in. He gives a speech to the entire team. He says, um, you got your pads today? Uh, if you don't want to play, turn them in. If you come back tomorrow, I need you to stay till the end of the season. Because quitters never win, and winners never quit. He said, if you quit my football team, you might quit school. Quit school, and get married, you might quit your wife. Have kids, you might quit your kids. Because once you quit the first time, it's easier to quit the next time. So I developed the mindset of, I was not going to quit. Because quitters never win, and winners never quit. Now, an example of how that has served me well is uh, I couldn't go get straight into the Naval Academy because my GPA and my SAT scores were not competitive. Uh, so they offered to send me to a preparatory school in Harlingen, Texas. Now, I'm in high school, my um, senior year in high school, right after football season, and myself and two other guys go to the office. We don't know why we're going to the office. In walks this guy, six foot three, blue uniform, white shirt, hat. He says, I'm from the Naval Academy, and I want to recruit you to play football. I didn't know what the Naval Academy was. The other two guys walked out. Now, this was during Vietnam. I graduated from high school in 1971. The other guys walked out. He said, I am not going to the Vietnam War. I stayed. I listened. My dad always told me, never turn down an opportunity you haven't been offered. So I listened. I listened and went home and talked it over with my dad, who was a World War II Marine. He said, that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good opportunity. I didn't, nobody else was offering me anything, so I decided to go. But I had the mindset of quitters never win and winners never quit. So I entered prep school, entered the Naval Academy, and my freshman year in chemistry, taking chemistry, right? After about two weeks, it felt like the instructor was teaching French, and I only stood English. It was not making sense. I went to my room, cried myself to sleep, and said, Lord, what am I going to do? It's one thing I wasn't going to do. I was not going to quit. So I contacted my instructor, and I said, I need some extra instruction. He spent about an hour with me, went over the formulas, made a little bit more sense. Um, 
But what I did was I committed to spending whatever time I needed to on chemistry. I said, I might not understand it, but I can memorize it. So I spent more time on chemistry than all my other subjects put together. I made a B in chemistry, first semester and second semester. But that was because of the mindset of quitters never win and winners never quit. Um, so quitters never win and winners never quit. That was something that, that was very, very important. Now, so after the Naval Academy, I decided to go into the Marine Corps. Not only did I decide to go into the Marine Corps, I decided to become a pilot in the Marine Corps. And they tell you in ground school, the first day of flight school, that the attrition rate is 66%. That means one out of three graduate. So I looked to the left, I looked to the right. I said, you guys are not gonna be here, because I'm gonna be here, because Coach Parks said quitters never win and winners never quit. So anyway, I matriculated through uh, flight school but that mindset, I think, was very, very important. And if you're a leader, that's also important. If you're a parent, that's important. Quitters never win, winners never quit. The second letter is T. The T stands for take care of your troops or take care of your people. In the Marine Corps, when you go to the field and you go eat in the field, the higher the rank, the later you eat. The lower the rank, the sooner you eat. So it's a demonstration of leadership takes care of their people. If you're in battle, you wanna make sure that your people are, are um, fed properly and taken care of. So that's what that symbolizes. Because if you take care of your people, your people will take care of you. If you don't take care of your people, your people won't take care of you. So you say, okay, Carl, that's good in the military. How is that applicable to Apex? I'm glad you asked that question. Let's assume that you are a quality supervisor, right? And you're making widgets. And these widgets just need to go out in a quality way. And I'm a supervisor and I'm a tyrant. I mean, I'm just brutal. I mean, I yell, scream, I do all that kind of stuff, right? So the quality person on this line, who's the final check to make sure that those widgets go out, I'm treating that person that way. And I give a direct order. You need to do X, Y, Z. And that person does X, Y, Z, knowing that there's gonna be some bad product that goes out. And when that bad product goes out and it comes back, guess what that person is gonna say? Throw me under the bus. Same scenario. I love my people. I treat them with respect. I know their family. I give the same order in a loving way, same order though, same instructions, that person will do one of two things. They will say, you know what, Carl, I don't think you need to do that because that's not gonna be good. Or, let's say it slips by him. When it comes back, it's gonna be a we as opposed to him. If you take care of your people, your people will take care of you. The R stands for relationships. No one gets anywhere by themselves. It's always about relationships. December 23rd, 2010, I went in for a routine colonoscopy. Doctor says everything looks good. I went to Florida to visit my wife's family. Couldn't lie on my stomach, couldn't lie on my back. Came home, went to the doctor. Doctor says, uh, I think it's this. Gives me some pills. Two weeks later, same, same. Oh, I know, I think it's this, I'm gonna give you some more pills. Same thing, not any better, right? Uh, finally, the doctor says, I'm gonna do an X-ray of your stomach. So the doctor does an X-ray of my stomach. And I'm at the office, the phone rings. Carl, this is uh, Dr. So-and-so. I see enlarged lymph nodes in your stomach, and I'm gonna refer you to an oncologist. That was the first time I heard the C word. Now, when I heard the C word, the castle word, I thought of three things. Number one, how long am I gonna be here? Number two, what am I gonna do while I'm here? And number three, how am I gonna spend my time? Those were the three things that went through my head. I wasn't thinking about how much money I had or how much stuff I had. 
Those were the three things that went through my mind. So I went to uh, an oncologist. They did a zillion tests, uh, biopsies, blood tests, CAT scan, um, PET scan, all kinds of stuff. And after about a month, and it seemed like a year, they finally diagnosed me with stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a type of cancer. Now, by the time I was diagnosed, I looked like I was eight months pregnant, sunken in face, skinny arms, skinny legs, looked like one of those starving kids from Africa. I was in bad shape because it was very, very aggressive. So <clears throat> at that point in time, I was sick and I was broke because I was broke because I'd gone through all my uh, long-term and short-term savings. So, I mean, I was pretty much, I didn't know what I was gonna do. You know, I'd always been an athlete, and I always told my wife, you know what, baby, if I got my health and strength, we can make it, but I didn't have my health and strength, and I didn't have any money. So what I did was I humbled myself and I said, I gotta call on some people, I need some help. So I contacted the president of the Alumni Association of my class at the Naval Academy, a guy named Kevin. Kevin contacted Keith, who was a company mate of mine at the Naval Academy. Keith put together a GoFundMe program before GoFundMe program was in existence. My classmates and alumni supported me financially for an entire year, some of which I hadn't seen for 35 years. That's why relationships, or that's an example of how relationships are so important. It's all about relationships. While I was going through my cancer journey, we were uh, sitting at the table at breakfast and we hear this noise outside. We look outside, we see three people, one on a tractor and two throwing straw. We didn't recognize them. Looked a little closer. It was Colonel Whitley. Colonel Whitley was my, my kid's Air Force Junior ROTC instructor and we had created a bond. Colonel Whitley um, paid for my lawn service for an entire year because we had created a relationship. When we were living in Topeka, Kansas, my wife was uh, pregnant with our second child. We had, a miscarriage, we, had a, we had a son, miscarriage, and then a pregnant with a, with a second child. And um, we went to Topeka, Kansas. Nobody was around, we didn't know anybody. We were the only people in the neighborhood that looked like us. And uh, my wife developed hyperemesis. Hyperemesis is a disease where you can't keep food down pregnant, so, but all the, all the food that you have, the nutrients that you have go to the baby. But anyway, she, she was hooked up to an IV from three months until the time the baby was delivered, right? So she's at home. I'm commuting 45 miles to Frito-Lite. And uh, one day she gets a knock on the door. Neighbor knocks on the door and uh, says, uh, I understand you have some health problems. She says, uh, uh, no, we're good. We're good. All right? Two days later, same lady comes with two other neighbors. Knocks on the door again. Understand you have some health challenges. And my wife said, nah, we're good, we're good. And then the lady said something, the neighbor said something that we'll never forget. She said, don't block our blessing. Don't block our blessing. Don't keep us from helping you. With that, my wife opened the door, let them in, those ladies fit, created meals, washed, uh, did laundry, did all that stuff for six or seven months because of relationships. So one of the things that we do is uh, we don't ask people sometimes, do you need help? We just help them because we know that people have pride. Okay? So it's all about relationships. And then the last pillar for me is F and it stands for faith. Faith, family, and friends. During the time period that I was going through my cancer journey, um, a neighbor called me who was a breast cancer survivor. And uh, Diana told me about what she called her chemo walk. While she was going through chemotherapy, she walked. Uh, and she walked a block, two blocks, three blocks, whatever it was, she always walked. She was a marathon runner, and eventually she got back up to becoming a marathon runner. So I'd been pretty sick, and um, my wife and my mother-in-law would treat me like an invalid. So I said, well, tell my wife that. 
So she told us that. And uh, I got up and worked, walked for the first time, walked a block with a neighbor that was uh, 14 years old, and then I continued to walk and continued to walk and continued to walk. So during the time period, which was February through June, I can smell the air, I can hear the birds, it just takes me back to that time period. Because I did a lot of walking, I did a lot of praying. I would say three scriptures, uh, the Lord's Prayer, the Prayer of Jabez, or the 23rd Psalm. And I would say those over and over until that negative stuff that was in my head left. If I was sleeping at night and I couldn't go to sleep, I'd say those three verses over and over and over until that negative stuff got out of my head. So faith, family, and friends. So faith was important. Uh, friends were important. Uh, again, we had several people that, that helped us. There was a doctor friend of ours, Dr. Peter. He was a trained internist with infectious disease specialty. He came over, looked through my records, and after about 30 minutes, I said, Doc, what do you think? He says, well, prayer really hurt. Prayer really helps. And this is a trained internist. He says, prayer really helps. He said when he was a young doctor, he had a lady come to him who had a uh, lump on her breast. Checked her breast, set her up for a, a, an operation on Thursday to do it on that next Monday. She goes home, goes to church, prays, comes back, does a self-exam. She can't find the lump. He can't find the lump. His partner can't find the lump. Lump gone. He said prayer really helps. But the other thing he told me is your body cannot heal under stress. So prayer and meditation keeps your body stressless, right? You have to eat right, sleep right, exercise, take stress out of your body for any illness that you have. So um, based on my life principles, I authored a book called Sharp Leadership, Overcome Adversity to Lead with Authenticity. It talks about my life. I've had a 10-year-old read it. 99-year-old great-great-grandmother read it twice. I had a 90-year-old 1953 Naval Academy graduate purchase my book. He bought 10 books, four for sons and six for grandsons. I had a 17-year Marine Corps veteran. Got out of the Marine Corps with post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, became a substance abuser, then he became homeless. Now he runs a shelter for homeless veterans. He says it's the first book he ever read from cover to cover in his life. I had a 12-year-old read it with his dad. I asked the 12-year-old what resonated with you about the book. He said, passive resistance. I said, passive resistance? I said, what does that mean? He told me. Because in my book, I talk about it's not what you call me, it's what I answer to. So if a 12-year-old can understand that, then bullying goes away because you can't bully me if I'm not paying attention to what you're saying. And I think one of the things that we suffer from today is... Uh, the opposite of mental toughness, whatever that is. You call it what you want to call it. You know, everybody's got their feelings on their shoulder. Um, but uh, my role and goal is to get it in the hands of as many people as possible. I really do believe it's a life-changing um, book with life-changing principles. I call it a manual for overcoming adversity in any environment, in any stage of life. And... Uh, that's, that my goal is to, is to do that. So, you know, I do speaking, I do business consulting, I do professional recruiting, uh, and uh, I'm going to open it up for questions, questions, comments, verbal abuse. <laughs> no questions are off limits. I, th or is it, no, everybody needs to be developed. I think that everybody has some raw talent that they're given, but that needs to be developed. Uh, I think the bulk of it is, uh, is what you've experienced or what you've seen. For example, if you grew up in a household, I mean, that's your leadership style. It is what it is. If you're at a table, and uh, there's a lot of arguing all the time and fighting and fussing. 
You're going to bring that to the workplace because that's your normal. Right? If you happen to grow up, you happen to grow up into a household, which is my household, <laughs> which teaches good leadership principles, you would expect those individuals to take those principles out to the workforce. So I think it's a combination. But I do believe that um, if, you're, if you're a student, between reading and learning and studying, you can, you, know, you can pretty much be what you want to be. I mean, there's some hardwired things like you might not want to talk to a lot of people all the time because it's draining, because you're an introvert, you know, but you can do enough as a leader to, to make that work. Other questions? Yes, sir. How do you um, how do you dial back to get that balance between work and life? When you first start your career out, you're kind of like um, on steroids to get to the top, and in the midst of that, a lot of stuff you you mentioned you neglect your family, your uh, your body, a lot of stuff you know you just neglect because you're on that like you say you're on that climb to get to the peak. But when you recognize that. How do you, uh, just to suggest, how, how do you scale back, like I said, without uh, maintaining your ground and your focus, but also regaining your family? I, I, I believe it's all about priorities. I can look at your day timer or your phone, and I can tell you what's important to you. If there's no time on there for family, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that um, it, here's the trick. When you're young and you want to learn, you got a lot to learn. Right. Um, and sometimes it's important to work 20 hours a week. I mean, 20 hours a day or 16 hours a day. Right. Um, but what happens is you get on that treadmill and you buy stuff. You got to pay for that stuff. You buy more of that stuff to keep up with the Joneses, you know. One, I mean, one of the things we did, we made a conscious decision that we were going to live off of one income. That was just a decision that we made, you know. So it's all about priorities, what's important. Um, the, when I worked with uh, executives at the Center for Creative Leadership, and they talked about work-life balance, they go back home and they start doing some things differently, you know. Uh, now, there are things that I call significant emotional events. An example of a significant emotional event is divorce, death of a loved one, sickness, job loss. Stuff like that will rock your core and life will never be the same. Sometimes it takes that kind of stuff to get you to do some things differently. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I, I think you have to know yourself. Uh, now, it, it's a tricky wiki because some of the best lessons that I've learned are lessons through trials and tribulations. A bad boss. Um, uh, a sickness. You know, it, it makes you... So, so the way I look at it is... I'll, I'll use this example. So when I when I went from um, when I moved here in 1999, I worked for uh, a golf ball manufacturer as vice president of manufacturing. Right. I came into the organization. The organization told me some stuff that was supposed to happen. It didn't happen. Right. So I did an assessment and I said, you know what? This is not a good cultural fit. So I'm going to leave. Uh, and that was a mutual thing because my boss flew in and we sat down and he said, uh, well, I'll tell you the story. So I'm, I'm at my office. My administrative assistant, who, who I had a good relationship with, called me and said, Carl, the ego has landed. I said, the ego has landed. The ego was my boss who was in England, headquartered in England. And he flew in to South Kakalaki and I didn't know he was coming. So I called my wife and I said, Jackie. Something might go down, but don't worry, God will provide. So he comes in with the HR manager, 
We sit down. He says, you know why we're here, right? I said, no, I don't. He said, well, things aren't working out. I said, I agree with that. So we agreed to, we, we mutually agreed to disagree and we part ways. So that was an example. I don't consider I quit. I consider that an opportunity to do something different. So you just have to make that call. Um, and I mean, different people have different stress levels and different, different um, thresholds of pain. Yes, sir. Who is the number one sports leader, political leader, and business leader in those categories? You want my opinion? <laughs> okay, give me the first one again. Sports. Coach. It don't matter. If player can, you know, a leader. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna say Jeff Davis. You ever heard that name? Okay, Jeff Davis is the, or was, the, the captain of the 1981 Clemson Championship team. Uh, played for Tampa for seven years. And, uh, and uh, walks out his faith, family, and everything. So he's a, I would say, good sports figure for me. And the second one, politics? Politics and then business. Business, business, business. Hmm. Man, business. I don't know if anybody. Uh, I'm not a groupie, so that's difficult for me to see. <laughs> politics. Uh, politics. I'll say uh, uh, President Obama. Politically, um, business-wise. Uh, Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an answer, but one of the things that's, that's interesting about um, leadership, when you get to the pinnacle of, it could be sports, it could be entertainment, it could be the military, it could be whatever, whatever your arena is, um, it's difficult to stay humble. Because I heard a saying one time that if you surround yourself with people that are yes people, then eventually you'll be surrounded with people that have nothing to say. Um, so you, you gotta always be looking for people telling you something that you can do better and different things like that. It's difficult because um, if you're the head of an organization, you know, people don't wanna bring you any bad news. <laughs> so you gotta ask for it. Business. Um, I'll give you an answer in a little bit. Other questions? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna answer that question. I'm gonna bring it to a scenario. Let's say I'm a, um, I'm, I have some people that work for me, right? I'm a leader of some people. <coughs> and somebody has some issues. <clears throat> some people in my organization have issues. It could be mental issues. It could be health issues. It could be behavior issues. It doesn't make any difference. My role and goal is to get them the resources that they need to take care of whatever they can take care of, whatever they can. I need to understand that, I need to understand that some of this stuff over here is out of my lane, out of my league, and I need some professional help, right? Uh, now sometimes it's difficult to separate that um, and people get out of their lane and they wanna worry about stuff they have no control over. And sometimes it's difficult because you love the person and all sort of kind of stuff. But being able to give the person the appropriate resources and the tough love that they need and the, and, and the other love that they need, that, that's the key. And it's, it's some combination of that, getting them the help that they need and then, you know, understand when you need to back off and when you need to come in. Uh, and that's, that's so, so what happens a lot of times is 
people are reluctant to bring in resources. You know, and, and I, I'll tell you one that's a, um, that's a, a re real big deal, mental, you know? People don't like to talk about somebody that has mental issues or something like that, but everybody's got issues, you know? It's, it's getting people the resources that they need to do what they need to do. And as a leader, that's the most important thing I can do. Because you can't check, you can't check your feelings and your stuff at the door all the time. If you got a sick uh, family member at home or a daughter that's pregnant, that person, they might not all be there. The best thing you can do is make them whole so they can be productive in your work room. Other questions? Did I answer your question, Tony? Any other questions? What's the biggest leadership challenge you faced out of the Biggest leadership challenge. Shoot, biggest leadership, biggest leadership challenge is leading my family. That's the biggest one. That's the one where, you know, I mean, you can't, you can't point no fingers at that one. You created it, and then you got to deal with it. Um, so that's probably the biggest challenge. I'll tell you something else, too. Um, I'll give you guys a secret. I'll tell you the, the, the biggest secret or the most important gift that you can give to your child is the ability to suffer well. We live in a society where everybody gets a trophy, uh, everybody's fixing the blame. So a lot of times we have these helicopter parents and they don't want their kids to go through anything. Child gets a B, they run up to school. How did my child get a B? How did my child get a B? Right? So they never go through anything, right? But because one of the things that's going to happen is it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Life's going to knock you on your butt multiple times. Then you got to figure out how fast are you going to get up and what are you going to do when you get up. So my daughter, I'll give you an example. So we, we, what we tried to do was create a um, safe environment for our kids so that they can learn skills. You can learn skills in the sports arena, a bunch of other things, right? So she was in Air Force Junior ROTC. She was a junior rising senior, Daniel High School, Clemson, South Carolina. And she'd been tagged to become the, com the core commander of her senior year. And she said, Dad, I don't want to become the core commander because my peers are not living up to the values that I think they need to live up to. I said, okay. So what are you going to do? You're not going to quit. So she was having a meeting with the senior, three senior officers uh, about this position that she was, she was supposed to, she was kind of interviewing for it. And I said, in that meeting, you need to tell them that you don't want to be the corps commander and why. So she did that. She came home. And I said, how'd it go? She said, it went okay. I said, well, tell me a little bit about it. She says, well, before they started, I stopped them and said, um, I have something I want to say. And I told them that I didn't want to be a corps commander and why I didn't want to be a corps commander. And I said, well, what'd they say? She said, they listened intently. So I use that example because she's 28 years old. She's resigned from two companies, two CEO companies, and had to have that type of conversation. Go in and say, I resign. So I tell her, I said, it's never going to be any more intimidating than a 16-year-old talking to three 50-plus-year-old officers in the Air Force. So that's an example of, of creating an environment where they can learn from that. My son, I'll give you another example. He's in uh, the ninth grade taking Spanish. I get a call. Your son's acting up, Carl the third. I say, okay, what do you want me to do? She says, well, you can come up here, you can threaten to come up here, or you can do nothing. I said, well, I'm coming up there. So I come to the class, I sit in the back of the class, and uh, he comes in, he says, hey, Dad. I said, oh. So class goes on. At the end of the class, he says, I'll see you at the car, Dad. I said, no, nah, come back here. I got something I want to say. So it was a teacher and a student teacher in the class. So my son comes back. I said, how, how was class? Is this a typical class? 
they all start laughing. No, no. One person says something, the other person says something. So I said, okay, well, I'm going to give you a choice, son. I said, first, I need you to apologize to the student teacher and the teacher in my presence. That's the first thing you need to do. Then I'm going to give you a choice on the second one. You can apologize to the class with me there or with me not there. Oh, I'll do it with you not there. Oh, okay. So he goes to the class, comes back home. I said, Carl, did you apologize to the class? He said, yeah. I said, well, how'd it go? He said, I don't know, Dad. It, it was interesting. He said, I said, did you apologize? He said, yeah. I said, okay. So you apologized, then what happened? My classmates asked the question, was Carl's parents the only ones called? <laughs> and then three other people got up and apologized. <laughs> but creating those environments where, where kids can learn uh, uh, in a safe environment, sports, you, you're not going to win every game. So what are you going to do when you lose? What do you do when you get an F? Anyway, so it's been a pleasure. And uh, if anybody wants to talk to me and have some ideas on how I can help them, I'd love to do it.